Hello, hello. Uh, good afternoon over there in, in Mexico. Good morning here. I'm, I'm um, over here in Dubai this morning, but very well glad to be connected with you guys today. Uh, everyone, everybody from the Founder Institute Monterey and everybody interested in, 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 in this session. We are very glad to, to and, and we have a panel of honor today, so we're very excited. So without further ado, let me start by introducing Foundry Institute, uh, which is the, the largest acceler pre-seed accelerator project in the world. We have over 2,000, I mean, 200 chapters all over the world. And we are in, um, we have a, a huge network of over 600 directors of over 45,000, um, 4,500 graduates. And it's a, a very complete project of 14 weeks that's composed of um, very interesting topics that we cover week to week, but that are also accompanied by, by uh, the help of very high level mentors and experts that help um, the pre-seed projects to become a reality or to get to the next level. But uh, thank you very much for, for being with us today. I will leave the floor to Mr. Mario Garcia, which is, my fellow co-director in the Founder Institute, Monterey Chapter. Gracias, Astrid. Pues aquí hablamos en inglés y en español. Ya saben, somos el capítulo de Monterrey. Eh, y pues bueno, un gustazo estar con todos ustedes, como hemos estado en los eventos pasados, promocionando por ahí el Batch 2022 de Founder Institute. Rápidamente, como lo saben, por ahí es codirigido por nuestro amigo eh, inversionista Rogelio de los Santos, que esta vez también va a estar ahorita aquí en el estrado con los panelistas de lujo que tenemos el día de hoy. Eh, Rogelio por ahí de Dallas Capital. Eh, está Astrid eh, Chedid, que ahorita está en Dubái, precisamente organizando un gran evento de inversiones que hace todos los años y lidera para Latinoamérica. Y su servidor, Mario García, eh, que soy el pues, encargado eh, y cofundador del Club de Ángeles Inversionistas Angel Hub. Pues es un gustazo, al, al, al igual que nuestros aliados, ¿no? Que por ahí juntos hacemos posible lo que es este capítulo de Monterrey, de Foundry Institute, que si quieres avanzar, por favor, eh, tenemos por ahí eh, abriendo ya y estamos casi listos para iniciar por ahí el 27 de abril el Batch eh, 2022. El año pasado nos fue muy bien. Se graduaron 11 equipos y bueno, pues ahora otra vez eh, los que quieran apuntarse, ahí está por ahí en la liga, ya saben, tenemos mentores de lujo, tenemos contenido de Silicon Valley y lo que queremos es ayudarlos a que lleven su startup al siguiente nivel. Acuérdense que estamos para apoyar founders y tenemos a muchos founders e inversionistas igual que, que los queremos apoyar y les damos las herramientas y las metodologías para que lleguen al siguiente nivel eh, pre-seed eh, y que bueno, pues que levanten rondas y por qué no, que lleguen con estos fondos eh, Ojalá que pronto, ¿no? Como los que tenemos aquí presentes, ¿no? Que, que bueno, son líderes de Latinoamérica, ¿no? Entonces, eh, aprovechen rápido, emprendedores, tómenle por aquí ahí el código QR y pues vámonos, les voy a presentar eh, rápidamente al panel de lujo que tenemos, donde tenemos por aquí a Eric Arker, de Founder y Managing Partner de Monashis. Hi, Eric, how are you? Hi, Mario. How are you? It's really nice to be here. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome, Eric. Y bueno, in Spanish, eh, Hernán Casá, eh, cofundador y managing partner de CASEC. Eh, bienvenido, Hernán. Un, un gustazo y un placer tenerte aquí. Hola a todos. El gusto es mío. Y bueno, pues tenemos a, a, a Rogelio de los Santos, nuestro co-director y co-founder y managing partner de, pues bueno, también uno de los fondos más activos de México y la TAM, Talus Capital. Eh, hola, Roger. Y... Bueno, por ahí eh, Rogelio trae unos detallitos técnicos. Está en el aeropuerto, él va en camino a Dubái al evento precisamente con Astrid. Y bueno, pues ahorita hubo un, hubo un movimiento por ahí en la sala y ahorita se va a conectar también con nosotros. Y bueno, eh, tenemos a René Lanquená, un emprendedor muy conocido acá en el norte, muy exitoso, eh, que es, cofundador, es fundador de White Paper, ¿no? eh, un medio mucho, muy interesante. Y pues bueno, René nos va a ayudar a moderar este panel. Eh, bienvenido, René. Gracias, Manuel. ¿Listo? Pues ahora sí, te cedo el micrófono. Adelante. Perfecto. Comencemos con lo bueno. All right, so I'm actually going to switch to English so we can 
do this. So it works basically for, for Eric and for all of us. But if there's any anyone that, that wants to ask a question in Spanish or, or, or anything, just let us know through the chat uh, functionality there. So I, I, I know the track record that you guys have and, and, and you've, been do, you've been doing this for several years now. You've been very active in the entrepreneurial sector in the whole region. Uh, how, how has it changed in the last 10, 12 years? How does it differ right now, the, 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 the kind of companies that you guys are seeing, the kind of entrepreneurs from, from how it was, say, beginning 2010, 2011? Well, I, I can start here, uh, Rene, thank you. And uh, thank you again all for the invitation to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, we started actually, you know, uh, Monashis in 2005. So maybe I can start uh, talking a bit about how it changed because we started, we joked that we started running the marathon, you know, five kilometers before the starting line. I mean, uh, the market really started, and I think Rene, you put it very well, that it's, you know, 2010, around 12 years ago. We actually at Monashis considered 2010 this year zero of, 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 of the modern tech VC industry in Latin America in this new phase. And, and there's a big difference between 12 years ago and, and today. Um, I think there was a combination of factors that created the condition, you know, conditions for the industry to take off in, in Latin, you know, initially mostly in Brazil. You know, there was this uh, exit of Buscapé in 2009, uh, acquired by Naspers, and then um, first investments by Silicon Valley VCs, you know, testing the waters. Brazil was growing, you know, the economy was growing, surfing the commodities wave. So you had this repatri repatriated Brazilians and foreign entrepreneurs looking at Brazil to start their, their new companies. Uh, and, and all these things combined and you saw the actually the beginning of the industry. Uh, it was it was very you know very vibrant, but still very early, and there was not a lot of capital. So you had capital for you know early stage investors, and maybe if you're lucky, a Series B in the first years. But I mean, not a lot of growth capital. Actually, what really changed from those first years, and and even entrepreneurs actually for the first time, most or maybe all the entrepreneurs were not proven or experience like you see today you see yeah. new entrepreneurs you know starting their companies so you you accelerate to today i mean it's completely different i mean you have especially in the last six seven years you know this flow of capital that i think actually happened because you had the maturing of those first companies that were built you know in the beginning of 2010 and the maturing of the companies and the lowering of interest rates and more capital available just had a great combination for the availability of growth capital to, to so entrepreneurs can build you know, greater, you know, bigger companies in shorter cycles is what we see today. But of course, you know, there are many things to talk. I'll just stay here, uh, stop here and say, hey, it's totally different. It happened. It took some time, but I mean, it's, uh, it's very uh, exciting what's yeah. happening. And what I, I, I have to say is that we're in the first three minutes of the game. Wow. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I'd like to complement uh, what Eric uh, said, and I, I totally agree with all his statements. Uh, we, we have as a fund, uh, this year we will make uh, 11 years uh, with CASEC, but we had 12 prior as entrepreneurs with Marco Libre. So we started in 1999. So <laughs> if in 2005 there was no ecosystem, imagine in 1999. Uh, but, but again, I, I agree with everything Eric said. The only thing I would like to add is that I think what changed on top of investors and, and growth capital and, and, and more experienced entrepreneurs starting business, etc., was penetration of, of, of internet, mobile internet. So you had critical mass that allowed many of those businesses to emerge that obviously attracted investors and all those kind of, of things. At the end of the day, the technology game is a game of scale. And at the beginning, you could only aspire to get to scale in Brazil because that was the only market where counting first internet users and mobile users was where you could get to, to critical mass. 
And that started to change, obviously kept on growing in, in Brazil big time, but then Mexico became a very relevant market. And today, what, what I typically say is that I think we're going to get to critical mass in almost all countries in Latin America. So, so in the past, if you were launching a business in Peru, you were doing that as your maybe your, your headquarters, but then you had to expand into other geographies to get to that scale. I think today you can build a business with scale even in, in Peru, and it will even happen, I don't know, in, in Uruguay, which is one of the smallest countries mm -hmm. in, in the region. So I think that, that that transformation was the increase of internet penetration, and that was led big time with, with mobile internet that transformed the region entirely. Make, makes sense. And, and Eric, you briefly touched on this too uh, a while ago, but regarding the entrepreneurs themselves, there's quite a change. I mean, you, you right now meet with people who have done this before or, or, or who been part of teams that have built large companies. And, and I, I guess that also has an impact in, in, in how enthusiastically you want to get involved with this kind of companies, right? Of course. No, no, it's a great point, uh, René. And, uh, and, and just before answering your question, just to complement, I think, great remarks by, by Hernan here. I really think that have to do, I mean, with different skills that were actually developed in the last 10 years, besides everything that we mentioned. I mean, two skills that actually didn't exist in the region, you know, in, in scale, which is uh, managing hyper growth and managing international expansion that allows for these pan-regional companies. So these are new things, new skills that are actually being put into practice and, and new entrepreneurs are being trained in the companies that actually are doing it. So we have a multiplication you know, effect. Uh, but answering your question about you know, the difference of, of, of entrepreneurs, when we started, I mean, uh, I, I, I like to say, I mean, there are two big trends, two big things, two parts of the equation that are very important here. First is that when we started in, in 2005, we would go to the top schools in Brazil. And in the beginning, we were only focused on Brazil. And then since 2015, we also became a pan-regional pan Latin American fund with investments in, in all the countries. But I mean, in the beginning, it was only about Brazil. So we went to top schools and, and top universities to talk about uh, high impact entrepreneurship and venture capital. And uh, at the end of these presentations with hundreds of students that were interested you know, in hearing, but we would ask, you know, who wants to be an entrepreneur? And nobody raised their hand, not even one person, not even a single person. So it's, it's really mar remarkable when Hernan talks about 1999, the previous cycle was even more risky and more, uh, uh, kind of difficult as a, as a, it was not a viable career option in the region. And, uh, and this is 2005. Today, you go to the same schools and same universities, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, even those that shouldn't be entrepreneurs. I mean, of course, there's a hype, there's a lot of capital, but even discounting that, you have this cultural change in the region of this, you, I want to be an entrepreneur or I want to start my career and start up and learn how to be an entrepreneur. But that part of the equation is only the first part. The second, maybe even more important uh, is, you know, I, I can tell you that uh, when we started, we, we would try to attract, you know, and, and invite uh, top entrepreneurs and tech uh, professionals from Silicon Valley to sit on boards and be advisors in our company. So we'll try to, you know, just uh, hell, uh, learn things. And, uh, and I remember very well, they would come in the beginning, some of them were interested in, in, for some reason about Latin America and curious, and they would come and they would say, uh, listen, there's a huge gap between these tech companies in Brazil and the companies in Silicon Valley. There's a huge gap. And, and we said, I mean, we know that. That's what we need to change, you know. Very, very few exceptions. And what I can tell you just to finish here, which is the, probably the best news, is that we, we, our companies, of course, receive a lot of invest, investments from global growth tech invest, investors, you know, from all around the world. Our companies actually have raised you know, like $10 billion in, in capital from all these like large global investors. And what I can tell you is that, and we are in touch with them continuously. And what I can tell you is that in the last two, three years, these global tech investors have spontaneously talked, 
you know, mentioned to us that today, some of the best founders and some of the best companies in their global portfolios are in Latin America. And I think that's the best news. Maybe we're not at scale yet, but I mean, we, we close the gap. And I think that's what's really exciting about it and shows the quality of the entrepreneurs we have. What do you think, Hernan? No, I totally agree. Just one extra data point that illustrates this is when you look at our first fund, that got started in 2011. I think we put together a portfolio of 24 companies. All of those were led by first-time founders. And when you look at the portfolio we're currently building, where we're probably two-thirds done there with, with the new, the latest fund that we raised last year, and more than half of the companies have second-time founders. Uh, and in, in, a few, in a few cases, we have even third-time founders. So clearly, the, the experience that those people bring today is totally different to the one they had 10 years ago. Uh, and even those that are not uh, second-time founders, they come from companies where they experienced technology firsthand, where they experienced this internationalization that Eric was describing, this scalability that, that they were built in, in other companies. So they come with much more relevant experience and, and that is what allows them to hit the ground running, right? And is what, what, exactly what Eric was saying. In the past, they were terrific entrepreneurs as well, but they required some hand-holding at the beginning because they didn't have the, the first-hand experience that today's entrepreneur, entrepreneurs typically bring. Wow. Yeah, so, so basically, uh, the size of the markets have changed. In regarding uh, smartphone penetration and such, totally. uh, you have more experienced entrepreneurs. Uh, people know what what uh, being an entrepreneur means, and, and even from a cultural uh, point of view, you have more local investors getting involved. So things have really changed in the past 15, 10, 15 years. And last year was absolutely amazing. Uh, if regarding at least regarding fundraising, the the amounts that were. Uh, um, destined for, for Latin American companies were absolutely groundbreaking. Is there anything else that has changed or, or what, was this just something that, that had to happen with, with the passage of time? Or is there any other factor that we should keep in mind? I think what, what, what happened was somehow expected by those that believed in, in, in the Latin American tech ecosystem. So, so Eric is clearly in that group, we are in that group, etc. As it typically happens, maybe it took longer than we initially expected, but then ended up being probably uh, much <laughs> more interesting versus what we had ever imagined. And I think, we're, as Eric said, we're just at the beginning of this, uh, I am asked now, so we will 2022 be larger in terms of amount of, of money invested versus 2021. I have no clue. My guess is that it will not be because of all these reasons that are happening in, in the market. So, but I'm totally convinced that by 2030, we're going to joke about the small numbers we had in 2021. So, so again, the trajectory is not always linear up and to the right, but, but clearly when you take a, a few steps back and look at it, it will be like that for, for sure. So what happened is what, what happens with, with ecosystems, right? It's, it's really hard to say this was the factor that initiated everything. In reality, it's typically a combination of things that, that have happened. And you mentioned all of those, we mentioned those already. So it has happened, uh, but the interesting thing is that we all believe I think I'm more convinced now that it will continue than I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So certainly I think the, the outlook is very positive. Is there something missing on the other hand? Something that, that, that you know that happens in, in more developed markets, but something that we're not seeing here regarding enter, entrepreneurs or their companies? Or I wouldn't say there's something missing, but obviously tech talent is something that we all want to have more, but you go and, and ask uh, Google Silicon Valley and they will tell you that. And you go and ask uh, an entrepreneur starting a company tomorrow in Monterrey and he or she will tell you that way. as well. Uh, so so I, I wish there were more uh, developers out there, 
but, but slowly but steadily that is also Very growing and there are new technologies that allow you to, to scale also the productivity of your tech team and the development of, of your code. So I think it's happening uh, and we will be solving all those friction points that we have and, and new friction points will emerge for sure. But, but that's the, the story of, of innovation and technology. Yeah, sounds about right. Mm -hmm. and, and regarding the, your actual jobs, the, the, the actual thing that you guys do, what, what, what key issues makes, makes you quickly decide to support an entrepreneur? Are there some, some things that you see that you say, you know, I, I want to fund this guy, this person here? Well, I can, I can start on, on this one. And just before I start, I just wanted to, to mention one, one point on the previous question and the previous answer, totally totally aligned with Hernan on, on other points. What I would mention that maybe we're, I wouldn't say we're missing, but I think it's a natural step. Um, I think we, uh, we are in the process of having more innovation. You know, I think Latin America is still kind of more execution driven. And uh, we see more and more innovation, but I think we're in the early uh, stages of, of true global innovation. And uh, when we started back in 2005, I think we had two, two dreams. One was to help put Latin America in the global map of tech because it was not, and today it is. Uh, and the second dream is uh, be Latin America be a, a, a center for Or a, or a region that actually creates innovation, tech innovation globally. And I think we will get there. So I think in my opinion, that's the, that's the next phase and we see it happening. But sorry, so going back to your, your, uh, your question on entrepreneurs, I mean, that's, that's basically the most important thing we do, right? I mean, uh, if you ask me, I mean, 10 years ago, I mean, what do you see, what do you analyze in, a, in an opportunity? I mean, we always said, oh, we have to see the team and the market and the business model and everything. And today, if you ask me, I mean, for me, the three most important things are the team, the team, and the team. I mean, it's, it's all about the team. The team will pivot. The team will adjust the business model. The pivot will find the market. We'll actually anticipate the market. So our, our focus is to is to really look at the founders and the team. And in, in, in my opinion, if you ask different, different people at Monashis, I mean, we have our, our frameworks, you know, to actually try to understand, you know, the psychology of the entrepreneur, because in the end, what you need to know, I mean, who are the entrepreneurs that will have the resilience? Who are the entrepreneurs that have what it takes? Uh, competence, uh, leadership skills, uh, the, the competence to build companies and everything. I mean, this is, this is actually, very important but it's not the only thing that is actually to be in the game to be in the game you have to be very competent as an entrepreneur but in my opinion what really makes the difference is the what drives the entrepreneurs why why they're doing it you know what is the passion behind it is the passion for impact is the passion for the problem they're solving no there are good passions and there are bad passions And uh, they have to have the good passions uh, because the passion will actually give the resilience and to, to face the ups and downs. And, and uh, the challenge here today is that uh, time, the, time, the, time, the, the, the time is compressing. I mean, you meet a great team and they already have like three term sheets or they want to decide in the next few days. So you don't have time to spend with them like the old days. But I don't miss the old days because then you had time, but you didn't have the same <laughs> quality of, of opportunities. But I mean, the challenge is to really try to understand very quickly, you know, uh, proven entrepreneurs, of course, are gold standard or entrepreneurs that were trained in very successful companies are gold standard. Uh, but you, what's really behind, I think, in my opinion, is the, what we really need to, to right. try to quickly get uh, and a good idea of. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I, and more from a personal level, what entrepreneurs need to have for us is, on the one hand, being very humble, and on the other hand, being rainmakers. And that's a very tough combination, right? Because you need to be humble, first and foremost, to, to know what you don't know, right? And, and, and to recognize that and, and try to surround yourself with people that can help you narrow those, those gaps. Uh, and that's something that, that we think it's very important because eventually uh, nothing is done 
by one person. Everything is done by, by a team. And the more complementarity you can bring to a team, the, the better. And the, the other piece is obviously that idea of being able to, to dream big, to understand things that are not evident today, and then make that, that vision happen, right? Make the impossible happen. So we try to look for, for that combination that is a very subjective thing, because how do you measure humility? How do you measure rainmakership? It's, like, it, it's really difficult to do that. But, but that's the, the special spark that you try to do. Because as, as I said, we, everyone that we meet is fantastic, right? If, if you look at, at the average population, those people stand out big, big time. So what you're trying to, to get is that very zero one point percent that, that, that can make the impossible happen. And, and, and for that, we, we see that if you are uh, too confident, you will probably will not make it. If you are very humble but, but do not have confidence, you will not make it either. So, <laughs> you need to. Can you share an example of someone that comes to mind when you when you talk about this? Yeah, so 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 a, a very obvious example, but but it's David Veres from from Nubank, right? Mm -hmm. a ridiculously smart person at the time when he got started, a very bright professional with a stellar career, GA, Morgan Stanley, Sequoia. But he knew that he knew nothing about the banking system in Brazil. He knew that he knew almost nothing about technology, even though he was an engineer. Uh, and, and, and he recognized that. And, and, and in minute one, he brought on board two co-founders that were basically tackling those two gaps that, that he had. But then he had a very clear vision of it was ridiculous how banks uh, operated in Brazil and, and how frustrated the customers were and, and how big the opportunity was and how uh, he could try to solve that with, with technology, right? And I think that that's the, the, the perfect example of someone that is ridiculously confident and also understands very clearly his gaps and, and, and tries to somehow bridge them. Yeah. Eric, any, anyone comes to mind? Well, several, several come to mind. I have to say, I mean, um, the founders of Rappi, you know, especially Simon Borrero and Seb Sebastian Mejia. I mean, they also, I, I, I agree uh, with that balance. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the, the ambition, you know, to really build something really kind of large, expand internationally very early in the, in the life of the company. At the same time, incredible um, people, you know, very, very, uh, very humble also. Um, and, uh, making it happen i mean uh, going early to to mexico going early to brazil and, and building a, a a very successful kind of, kind of regional company so that that's that's one example yeah it comes to mind yeah you know m many of, of those in the audience right now might be working on their first startup at, uh, on their first company and, and and you've already talked a bit about the the traits that you that you like to see in founders but what are the two or three things that 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 first time founders really need to nail from the beginning or really need to make sure that they work? I think the, the list is, is always long, <laughs> uh, but if I had to, to pick two or three things, I would say one is to be able to articulate really well that long-term vision and understand well, what's that problem that they are solving or what's that opportunity they are creating. Uh, and if you can, Articulate that in a way that makes other people want to be part of it. I think that that's fantastic. And if you get somehow trapped into the explanation and it doesn't seem to be so clear, then you, you lost the battle before you started it. So, so that very, very clear vision, but it's a vision that, that probably you want to be there in 20 years, you know, not, not tomorrow. And then the other piece that is exactly the, the opposite of that is know exactly what are the most important things you need to do next quarter or, or next six months. Uh, and then the, the rest, it will happen as, as you move and you will learn things. But, but sometimes we have entrepreneurs that cannot articulate well that vision and it doesn't seem to be very compelling for us. Sometimes you do have someone that can articulate that vision, but then when you tell so, so what are the most important things that you need to start doing now, right? I don't know yet, I have to figure it out. 
Uh, and there's a gap. Uh, and then sometimes you have someone that tells you exactly with lots of precision what will happen in the next 20 years. And you know that that is impossible to, to happen because uh, the, the unexpected is always what, what wins. So, so you need to be able to find that, that balance of that terrific long-term vision in a compelling way and clarity on what you think are the, the two, three, four things you need to accomplish next uh, quarter, next six months, next year. Great. Yeah. yeah, to complement uh, some, some other points, I think, uh, well, of course, choosing the, the problem you're going to solve, I mean, it's at the top because it has to be a relevant problem. Uh, and, and, and you have to have, you know, an identification, some, some type of identification of that problem. I mean, we see some teams just looking for, you know, things to do or, or getting inspiration from businesses in, in other geographies. And sometimes they, they don't stop to think that they, they will have to deal with this for many years. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not time. like six months, you know. So uh, I think I would choose very carefully the problem you're solving. Sometimes it's natural. Sometimes you have to do a lot of homework. The other thing is choosing uh, as, as a single, let's say, as an entrepreneur, choose, choose your co-founders very carefully. I mean, the other thing we see today is sometimes some type of anxiety of like, oh, I need to have a team or co-founders to complement me and let's choose. I mean, I met these people like three months or a few weeks ago and let's do it, you know. Uh, it's, um, you have to spend time with your co-founders. Ideally, know them well. Of course, you have many, many teams that come and they know each other for a long time, which is great. But, you know, try to, to avoid the kind of the last minute thing and, and you know, complement each other, know that you're really, you know, aligned you know, you, you have a human alignment about the, the vision and what you're doing. And finally, I mean, more, more practical thing that we also see today, less problems, but we used to see a lot of problems is, is the cap table. You know, just protect the cap table uh, from the beginning because we saw a lot of teams that came with, uh, uh, did an angel round or friends and family or even a small seed fund that, completely unbalanced the cap table. It's not impossible to fix, but I mean, the, the more you, th you, know, you start in the right way, and today there's a lot of knowledge just talking to other founders on how to do it. I think that's very important too. Well, some, sounds great. I, I have some, some questions that people are starting to, to post here on the chat, so, I, so I'll start reading them. Guillermo Guzman asks, what, sector, what sectors do you see growing better in Latin America within the next three years? I think in our case, uh, we, we typically focus more on founders than on sectors. So we yeah. may have a list of sectors uh, as potential targets, but then an entrepreneur comes with a terrific idea, an extraordinary person, and we end up investing in a sector that we had no clue that was interesting before meeting that entrepreneur. Uh, but, but having said that, I would say that uh, certainly we, we remain quite bullish on, on fintech. I think there's still lots of things to, to be built in that space. And, and the way we see it is that there was a first wave more related to the consumer. And still within that wave, I think there's a long way to go. Then there was a second wave related to B2B. And I think we're in, in, in the middle of that wave. We're going to see many companies emerge in that space. And the third one, which is the, the newer one, is that layer of the infrastructure layer, right? And uh, what is going to be built to make our uh, finance in general more open, more efficient. And, and there you, you will probably eventually connect that with, with initiatives around crypto and, and Web3. So all those areas, I think, will, will grow in arms. Keep growing, yeah. Eric? I um, I think the same the same here on the on the found, focus on the founders. I mean, uh, you, you you see sometimes you know this image of venture capital, you know, really thinking about trends and which ones are the sectors and focusing on sectors and and thesis. And in the end, what we have in venture capital is just a, a privilege of having kind of an advanced post that you can see the deal flow and you see what the best founders are working on. And that's, and, and we follow that. We follow, you know, we can have a great thesis about sectors, but if we don't have, don't find the best founders 
<laughs> building companies there, it, it's useless. And at the same time, as I mentioned, I mean, we have to keep an open mind. That's the exercise, the open mind to be surprised and see a good opportunity, something that you were not expecting. In, in Latin America, in terms of sectors, I mean, naturally, to, to, you, you want to build very large businesses, of course, you know, the, the, the high impact entrepreneurs and in venture capital want to large businesses can be very large. So naturally, these businesses will follow on the B2C side, you know, the, the, the spending of the families. So it's, it's about living expenses and prop tech and, and, uh, and, and health and, and foods and delivery networks around food, education, transportation and mobility. Uh, and of course, you have the enabler sectors like fintech and fintech infrastructure and logistics. And you have B2B, which, of course, with the digitalization of small, medium companies, you see great opportunities in, 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 in those areas and B2B marketplaces. Um, so so it, it's not, in my opinion, going to go you know, out of these sectors as for the largest companies. And, but of course, we can always be surprised. Great. Another question, this comes from Camila, and, and she's asking how to bridge the gap of getting funding for founders that have not the signaling of being ex rapis or coming from a top US university. So I'd say that 50% uh, of the founders we, we backed in the last uh, fund uh, had that ex rapi kind of halo, but, but the other half do not have it, right? And they are all extraordinary people and this is a very Darwinian process, right? So it's not that every founder that wants to start a company will get funded. I think today, the chance of getting funded are ridiculously higher versus what they were five, 10, 15 years ago, but still uh, you need to convince someone to, to invest in your company. And for that is going, going back to what we were discussing earlier, a very compelling uh, idea, being very compelling in the way you present that idea and making sure that you, you know the zoom in, zoom out, right? So, so this is what I want to accomplish and this is what I need to do now for that. These are the people I brought on board to complement me. Uh, so so all, all the pieces that, that investors will look into, is there a, a a secret formula that will guarantee you there is not. It's like when, when you apply to business school, like you, you know what you have to do, but, but there's no perfect recipe for it. But certainly the more you have of that, the higher your chance of, of succeeding. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would complement that with at least how we, how, we, how we think about it. I mean, of course, we want to invest in in, 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 in founders, you know, building companies and, and all the other investors. And if there is a perception of, of lower risk, of course, there will be more investors interested. I mean, that's just natural. And, uh, and if you put in a very simple kind of two by two matrix, I mean, proven entrepreneurs or very experienced entrepreneurs actually replicating a business model that is going well in another geography, the perception of risk is very low. So everybody goes there, but there's no free lunch valuations go up. I mean, uh, as, as investors, we are very careful with portfolio construction. We don't want to invest only in that quadrant. We want to invest in first time entrepreneurs. We want to invest in innovation because those are the opportunities where you have, you know, um, uh, you, you know, great, you know, uh, 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 great prospects too. So it's it's a matter of portfolio construction. Of course, naturally, you will see more of the capital going in that quadrant. There's nothing we can do about it. But I mean, it doesn't mean that there's no capital available for for the other for the other situation. Sounds, sounds interesting. I, I have another question here from Eduardo de la Garza. Eduardo, nice to hear from you. Uh, what would be the right balance for a seed stage cap table with 500K or 1 million USD investment? Hmm. The right balance for a seed stage cap table that, that uh, I'm guessing this is a company that, that's going to receive between 500 and 1 million US. You know, how much dilution is asking probably? I'm, how much I'm thinking, dilution yeah. Yeah, yeah. For, for 500? Well, it's, uh, it's really, it depends so much, but I mean, I wouldn't. Ideally, you want to, as a, as a founder, 
I know you don't want to dilute more, more than, than, than 10%, I would say, I mean, in a, in a seed stage or something with that type of check. I mean, just to give you a number, I don't want to yeah. say, oh, it's very yeah, small, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, I, I would, I, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a large check, but it's a good check to start. Um, and and uh, you have to, you know, find the, the, the right investors that will recognize that it's important to, to leave space, you know, for other investors in the future and to keep the incentives um, for the team, yeah. um, uh, high, you know, for the team. Yeah. I, I think it's hard to answer that because it's typically case by case, but, but certainly what you don't have to do is to give up 50% of your company for that amount of capital, right? Because no, no matter what happens then, you're probably starting with the wrong uh, foot. And then if it's 5, 10, 15 percent, 20, obviously the, the lower the better, but, but that depends also on what kind of alternatives you have. But, but uh, avoid those extreme situa situations that put you basically out of the game before you, you start playing it. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, there, there are some questions regarding Web3. Everyone wants to know uh, what are you looking at? Anything you've invested yet in the, in the sector? We started investing in, in, in some crypto companies, more and more in protocols and on, and on tokens and, and currencies. I think there, there's a ter terrific opportunity there. Mm -hmm. There are still some challenges, right? So, so well, one of the uh, things that, that some people are thinking now, and, and we agree with that, is that uh, Web3 has tremendous potential and, and has been able to, to show that they can even finance uh, themselves without the need of, of, of typical <laughs> disease, right. mm -hmm. but, but that they still lack, I think what, what, what Web2 did was creating a terrific user interface, terrific layer for all of us to, to get access to, to technology easily. And Web3 is still really cumbersome in, in that regard. At least I, the way I see it, probably my, my daughters don't see it like that, right? but that, that's the way I, I, I see it. Uh, and I think that once that combination gets unlocked, when, when Web3 can acquire the, the usability layer that Web2 so successfully built, I think the sky is the limit for that. Mm. I, yeah, I, I, I agree that, you know, it's, it's, you can't deny the potential. I mean, with everything that's happening and it's accelerating so fast. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a new platform, you know, of course, crypto, NFTs, DeFi, you know, crypto's investments or, or, or its payments. I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. So in terms of opportunities, we haven't invested yet. We looked at uh, several things in the deal flow, but haven't, haven't invested. Um, but it's uh, in terms of opportunities is 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 really great. Uh, when you when you look at, at uh, it, it's, it's it's really high potential. It's very it's, say everything is great, but it's very high potential, and we we have to look at it. Uh, but if you if you look at the other aspects, you know that that you know uh, of this whole trend. I mean the DAOs, for example. I mean if you look at the DAOs, I mean then you know there's a there's a proven you know proven dynamics in. In, in VC uh, that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's too early to tell if that is going to succeed or not, especially when you give access to a broader base of, I don't know, retail investors and individual investors that don't understand, you know, what venture capital means or investing in very early stage, the type of risk, you know, high risk, long-term investments depend on access to the best opportunities, depend on portfolio construction. So then you can backfire in the future depending on how it goes. And so depending those aspects, I will be more careful. Early to know. And then with this, I'm actually going to go back to one of the topics we were talking about because there's a question here that, that I feel it's interesting. Is, is age, a, age a key factor when, when choosing an entrepreneur? Uh, being above 50 is less interesting than below 30, or is, or is age something that doesn't matter at all? This is something that's as being asked here by Juan Pablo Gonzalez. I think that there's, there are two aspects, right? right? Age typically comes with more experience, <clears throat> but also typically comes with less energy. <laughs> uh, and if you can combine both, you can 
be someone with lots of experience and still with energy and, and really looking for the next uh, 10, 20 years and not the next five. I think you are the, the, the best possible entrepreneur. And we've invested in entrepreneurs that are 60 years old uh, and we invest in entrepreneurs that are 18. And, and, and when we invest in, in the 18 year old entrepreneur, we say, what the heck are we doing? <laughs> uh, and then when we invest in the 60 year old entrepreneur, we say, hopefully he's still alive when he <laughs> <laughs> gains liquidity. But, but, but no, I, I think on average, entrepreneurs tend to be younger. Probably the, the ideal age is, is around 30 because you have some experience, but still long lots of you. energy and a long runway ahead of you. But, but it's also case by case. Yeah. Yeah. Age, age is, not a, is not a factor for us. I mean, it, it reflects, I mean, the, of course, uh, the, the, the profile of the deal flow, of course, you see more kind of younger entrepreneurs, but we don't, we don't have any, any kind of, of uh, age preference. I mean, again, it, it's similar to that open mind. You have to have an open mind to see an mm-hmm. incredible entrepreneur. 18 years old or, or 50 or 55 or 60. So. Yeah. Um, regarding the sectors and going back to, to, to that, that question, Pedro here is asking, you know, fintech, health tech, prop tech, crypto, e-commerce seem to be very hot right now in the region. Uh, but there are all other areas such as social networking and med- maybe advertising based projects. Uh, that seem to be outside the radar. Is, is Latin America not ready for media and entertainment, for example? As, or are you guys seeing anything in like more atypical sectors? I can start uh, with that one. Go, go ahead. Well, if you, go ahead. No, um, we, we don't, have, again, I mean, um, we haven't seen, of course, the past uh, is not a, uh, we're not seeing that the past, you know, we're not driving looking at the rear mirror. But I mean, you know, in terms of entrepreneur-driven kind of uh, VC-backed, uh, you know, companies in, in media and entertainment in, in tech, uh, there are very, very few, I mean, uh, opportunities. I mean, uh, it, 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 it tells you something, but of course, at the same time, you know, you see kind of gaming, wildlife, I mean, huge success. So you have to be open to that too. Of course, it's, I, I wouldn't say uh, it would be the, the big priority and where all the great new companies will come from. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and sorry, I may sound repetitive here. I mean, we, are, we don't have any, any problem with, with, with those companies and we review them all the time and we talk to them and, uh, and uh, we, we've invested in, in the past and we are open to invest again. I just don't think, you know, it's, it's, it's at the top of the opportunism. That's my feeling, but maybe, mm-hmm. maybe wrong. Oh, I, I agree with that. And in our case, we invested in, in a couple of companies in those spaces, one more on the social network side, another one more on the entertainment side. And both businesses did not go, go well. Uh, and then the number one challenge was that from the get-go, you need to be very global. So if you are entertainment, you need to have global entertainment available. Otherwise, you are at a big disadvantage versus the global players. And that being started out of Latin America, it's always more challenging because you have someone that starts out of the US. So that's a larger market. So from day zero, they can pay more for that content and you are at a disadvantage. Uh, and, and we all consume global content, right? We, we like, I don't know, me- Mexican movies and Brazilian movies, but also Hollywood movies or I don't know, yeah. French movies. And, and if you can have access of at all of those, you become more of a destination than if you are just focused on Brazilian movies or whatever. And in terms of social networks, the same thing, right? Uh, you want to connect with everyone globally. And I don't know, if I'm from Argentina, maybe half of my friends are from Argentina, but the other half are from all over the world. And I want to be in a platform where I can connect with all of them. Uh, and when you start, again, out of Latin America, it's harder for you to build that reach out initially. So your product needs to be significantly better versus someone starting that out of more of a of a core area like, like, like the US or, or, or large country in Europe. So again, it's not impossible, but, but, but yes, uh, we've seen it. That has been more challenging. Oh. And, 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 I, and, and sorry, just I, to this point, 
totally agree. I mean, you have to be you have to be global. I mentioned the example of of wildlife, and just to tell you a real example, I mean, we 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 we, we love what's happening with the, the creators' economy and this creators' revolution. So there are great opportunities, but. I, I agreed uh, with Anand that, that you have to be global from the start. We just invested in a uh, in a music tech company that hasn't hasn't launched yet, but it's global and uh, and from Latin America, and uh, so so that just shows that we are open to making these investments and there are opportunities, but it's just um, maybe a different profile of of, uh, of risk and ambition. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, guys, so I think we're running out of time. This has been uh, really amazing, at least from from my point of view. Uh, I'd, I'd like to to thank you, but give the word to Astrid, so maybe she can. I have another another question, just maybe oh, okay. to wrap up. Uh, I would like to know which are the top skills that you feel the entrepreneurs need to level up and to become um, a model founder for you to invest in them. Uh, I think we, we talked a little bit about it and, and there are many things, but something that sometimes doesn't come up so naturally out of Latin American entrepreneurs is the capacity to, to, to do the storytelling. Uh, and, and that's very, very, very important because that, that's what you need to do to have that compelling vision and transmit that compelling vision to others and have others willing to, to join uh, your company. So again, they've improved big time versus the kind of storytelling that we heard 10, 20 years ago, but, but still uh, there's a gap. And I think it comes back from the, the, the Latino kind of way of being where we, it's not so natural for us to, to speak about ourselves and, uh, and, and somehow sell what uh, we are offering. Confidently sell, right? Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's it's a great answer. The other one that's I think it's it's getting better and better every day, but I think we still can improve. As is not a skill, but is uh, is the level of ambition. I mean, uh, and, and it, it has really improved in the last 10 years, as we discussed. But I mean, we still have, maybe for similar reasons than what uh, Hernan said. I mean, sometimes, you know, kind of a little lack of, no, it, this is, will be good enough. No, I mean, that uh, has to do with, with, uh, with the confidence, you know, to really build something really amazing. So, I mean, we're getting much better. It's incredible today what you have, what you see in the teams, but I think it still is a big movement we can improve that. Thanks so much. Uh, Mario, I don't know if you want to wrap up. No, yes, no, just uh, thanks a lot, Hernan and Eric. It was a very, very uh, useful uh, conversation with you guys. It's it's an honor for us, uh, for Founder Institute Monterey, to have uh, to have you here. Uh, you know, to to people, to funds that have supported and improved a lot the ecosystem of LATAM. So, thanks a lot. And finally, how do the audience can contact you or your funds? Uh, so, can you give us, you know, like a handle or or, or an email or something? Sure, Hernan at kasek.com. Happy. It's, it's our job to, to listen to entrepreneurs. Yeah. So happy to, to receive their comments, questions, business plans. Thank you. Hernan. Likewise, Eric, Eric at monashis.com. So yeah, this, uh, we can direct them in and to, to the team and, and discuss. And, Thanks a uh, lot. And Rene, well, everybody knows that, that you can contact him at whitepaper.mx. White but what, what is your email, Rene? I'll write it here. The Rene at white, whitepaper.mx. Well, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was a pleasure. Nos vemos, por favor, en el próximo evento de Founder Institute Monterrey. Por ahí va a ser eh, a finales de abril y va a haber sorpresas. Y por favor, regístrense los que no han aplicado para el Batch 2022. De nuevo, Hernán, Eric, nos vemos pronto. Gracias por todo. Seguimos en contacto. Gracias, René. Muchas gracias. Gracias a todos. Gracias.
Gracias. Buenas noches. Buenas noches.